So good evening uh, and welcome to this event in the Scottish Geology Festival. It's uh, great to have you here and it's a uh, really nice opportunity for the Edinburgh Geological Society to bring together a, a small panel uh, of uh, students and experts uh, in uh, climate change and climate change mitigation uh, and uh, to really to, to ask the question. Uh, looking to 2045, uh, what is Scotland going to look like uh, if we are successful in uh, reaching uh, net zero? So we're going to consider different aspects of this, uh, taking a geological perspective um, and uh, looking at uh, the issues around climate change and particularly how we can reduce uh, carbon emissions uh, and how we're, we're sorts of things that we're going to have to cope with in terms of climate change that we're, we're, is already happening happening and will happen over the next uh, few decades. Uh, so please feel free to ask questions as we go along. Uh, we have uh, four presenters uh, who are going to give short uh, overviews uh, and uh, then we'll uh, discuss various aspects and, and uh, uh, finish up uh, about probably about quarter past eight. That's what we're aiming for, but we'll see how we get on. Uh, this event uh, was an event in the Edinburgh Science Festival uh, this summer. Um, and it worked really well as an outdoor uh, walk uh, in the Holyrood area, into Holyrood Park in Edinburgh. Uh, and it was a nice way to be out there in the landscape and to be looking around, thinking uh, about the, the city uh, and how it uh, would uh, change between now and, and 2045 or 2050. Uh, but uh, because the Science Festival wasn't at quite the right time of year, not the normal time of year, the, the audiences were a bit small. So we thought it'd be nice to bring it to the Scottish Geology Festival as a premier at the Edinburgh Science Festival, uh, bring it here for uh, a, a, another uh, attempt to uh, share this and uh, enthuse people about it. Okay, um, let's uh, get started. And uh, great pleasure in inviting uh, Matthew Stasis to start us off. Uh, so Matthew's just finished a master's uh, at the uh, School of Geosciences at Edinburgh University. And uh, it's, uh, he's been a very keen supporter of the Scottish Geology Trust uh, and the Scottish Geodiversity Forum uh, before that. I first met him when he was about 60, something like that. So it's uh, great to uh, have Matthew contribute uh, tonight. Uh, Matthew, would you like to start your screen share and uh, take it away? Yeah, no worries. Okay, is everyone seeing that now? Yeah, that's looking good, Grant. Fantastic. Okay, thanks everyone, and thanks for that nice introduction, Angus, as well. Um, so, um, again, thanks for having me along tonight to talk to you a way about my research uh, I've done this year for my Master's by Research project, and really uh, kind of kicking us off on looking to really the geological past and seeing what lessons can uh, past climates teach us about uh, today's climate change and its context. Um, and really, I want to pose this question, what difference does a few degrees make? Uh, we hear in the news all the time, we hear the Paris Agreement, we hear 1.5 degrees, we hear 2 degrees, 3 degrees, 4 degrees, but what does that actually mean in terms of a change in climate? So these are uh, concepts I'd hope we uh, can kind of uh, get a better uh, handle on by the end of this short presentation. So I've shown in this fr uh, first diagram here, um, this is some work done by uh, researchers at the University of Edinburgh and their collaborators as well. It's a, pretty much a, um, over uh, many decades of work of different uh, paleoclimate proxy records for the last 66 million years. What we're really looking at here, uh, this graph is showing the, the change in the average temperature of the planet uh, over the past 66 million years. So we can see that um, Today, we are here in this kind of blue air zone, which is termed as ice house. But as we progressively go deeper into the uh, geological past, we actually see that around 50 million years ago, we were in a really warm climate, um, a hothouse climate, um, where uh, there was no polar ice caps and we had alligators living uh, in the Arctic. So a very different world indeed. And what's really interesting is when we compare uh, anthropogenic uh, projections of our climate into the next few centuries, you can actually see that there is no analog uh, of future or modern climates. Um, you could call them ununiformitarianism. So if you think about Hutton's laws of uniformitarianism, in which uh, the, the past is the key, the present is the key to the past, 
um, there is no precedent of what we're doing to today's climate in the geological record. The rate of change is just uh, unprecedented. And by 2100, we have a, a range of different scenarios we can see here. We've got RCP 2.6, RCP 2.5, and RCP 8.5 is the, the probably the, the worst case scenario, which I'll focus on for tonight's talk. But it's interesting to see that by the end of the century, there's a radical different uh, outcomes, uh, potentially warming by just under two degrees, all the way up to warming of over four degrees uh, is expected. So there's a radically different uh, outcomes. And hopefully at the end of this talk, you'll see that um, we have a lot to say in which outcome we would like to go down. Um, what's quite interesting, and in, uh, maybe just to highlight briefly going before moving forward, is that the latest IPCC uh, report that came out recently highlighted um, some paleoclimate uh, reference periods, uh, which they define as periods in the past, which uh, certain processes or certain uh, geological settings were favourable to understanding what's happening today. And one of these uh, time intervals are known as hypothermal events. So these are these very spiky temperature increases we can see predominantly dominating the kind of orange red area of the of the, uh, this graph here, the, the very warm hothouse climates, which some projections actually project we might actually enter. So what did I do for my research this year and how does that kind of relate to all this? So kind of what, what's the consequences of this kind of R, RPC 8.5 kind of worst case scenario world? Why do we need to limit our warming uh, so it doesn't reach plus four degrees? So uh, I looked at this, one of these spiky uh, warming events, hypothermal events, which is called the late Maastrichtian warming event. It happened about 66 million years ago. So that's as old as a T-Rex. It's quite far back, we need to go to find a somewhat uh, analog of climate change to uh, what we're doing today. Not exactly the same, but it's the best, one of the best we have, these kind of hypothermal events. What we can see that the, the, the spiky events actually quite broad. It's not actually a, a kind of a straight line that we're seeing in some of our records for projections of today. And what we're actually seeing is that this kind of uh, prolonged warming uh, geologically speaking, was quite abrupt, but uh, as you can see, it was only 60,000 years. So geologically speaking, very abrupt, but uh, in terms of today's climate change, very long compared to 200 years of anthropogenic emissions. What my research looked at was, uh, was this warming event caused by an, an uh, increase in CO2 from volcanism. And to understand that, the, the kind of methodology behind that would be to, in a scenario where we had increased volcanism uh, releasing lots of CO2. So back then it was volcanoes, but today it's, uh, you know, humans. But the same process remains. An increase in CO2 would enter the atmosphere and be dissolved by the oceans. The ocean's acidity would increase or the pH would drop and the chemistry of the oceans would change. And we actually see a decrease in uh, something called borate ions. And that decrease can be uh, actually recorded in the shells of uh, microfossils like this uh, benthic planktic foram that I looked at. And what we do is we collect these fossils and pretty much brick crush them up, dissolve them in acid and put them through a fancy machine and we can get th these data points. And what the, the data here really nicely shows is as we enter the warming event, we actually see a decrease in the ratio of boron to calcium. And what that really just means is we're seeing a uh, increase in ocean acidity. So ocean acidification is taking place. And we also see that it stays quite low. We've got a prolonged period of acidification and it only starts to start to recover here as we start to cool. So it really kind of highlights that um, simple chemistry of increased CO2 consequences will be ocean acidification. And we can see this nicely in the geological past. And it's something that if we go down certain pathways of high CO2, um, we it will happen again. So looking ahead to COP26, and just to uh, briefly conclude, what, what's the main messages from looking towards the geological past? And really the main message is that humanity now controls Earth's thermostat. It's not a case that we are like this dinosaur over here and we're at the, the mercy of these large volcanoes. We know that today that uh, anthropogenic climate change is caused by our uh, emissions of burning fossil fuels and releasing carbon into the atmosphere. And what we can see here is just that this, 
that the magnitude of that change, a four degree temperature rise, is the equivalent to these large volcanic eruptions 66 million years ago over a 60,000 year period. So we're doing that in a fraction of the time. But there is hope. Um, even though the upper range of current policies project a warming of just under uh, four degrees, um, uh, back in March 2021, we saw actually with the introduction of the Biden administration that pledges and targets that were suggested actually drop this to down to around 2.4 degrees. So that's more like RCP 4.5 than 8.5. So it's a it's a marked difference, but still a lot of work needs to be done because, um, as you've seen from this graph here. Uh, just recently in September 21, uh, a new report came out and it's pretty much said that not a single G20 country has yet is not in line with the kind of Paris 1.5 or 2 degree scenario. We're up here at 4.5. So if we keep on going as we're going, we won't have a dramatic, terrible worst case scenario, but we're still going to be in a very um, warmer world, maybe two and a half degrees warmer. And, uh, you know, that's very different there's never been a climate like that in the last three million years so be before mankind was even a thing so just to conclude uh, humanity is a geological force there's no dis uh, dis uh, dispute in that um, but it's one with a conscience and i think that's important when we're going ahead to cop 26 that we it's within the power of the geoscience community and ourselves to really help determine the climate future for future generations uh, simple things that we can do really have a, a dramatic radical impact uh, on what type of future we want for future generations. So I'd like to stop there and happy to take questions at the end or move on to our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthew. So a very clear story from uh, the geological record uh, about what's uh, ahead of us. Uh, anyone get any questions at this stage? Uh, feel free to use the chat if you, uh, as we go along if you, if you want to ask uh, the speakers uh, uh, any questions. Uh, so uh, it's pretty clear that uh, we're on the wrong path at the moment. And uh, the um, evidence is very clear about, about what that means. And uh, so we'd like to move on now to, to look at, well, what are we, what are we going to do about it? What uh, solutions are there uh, and what problems are there in terms of trying to move towards uh, net zero? What impact will it have on, on, uh, on Scotland? So delighted to welcome Robert Gatriff, who's uh, past president of the Edinburgh Geological Society, uh, retired uh, geologist from the British Geological Survey, uh, and uh, he's just going to talk uh, briefly about uh, uh, electricity production and uh, precious metals, the metals that are needed to make it all work, uh, where they're going to come from. Um, oh, sorry, I'm on the wrong start of your presentation. I think that's the last slide, isn't there it? There we go. Okay. That's that. <laughs> okay. But it's funny that I'm a marine geologist by background and perhaps more in the subsurface. So talking about electricity in Scotland, I'm a, I'm a bit of a fraud, but um, you'll see it's linked to geology and, I, and I'll see what I can do. And it's interesting at the moment uh, in Scotland, these figures are from the Scottish government. We in effect can produce nearly all our gross consumption of electricity from renewables already. Uh, and in fact, we overproduce electricity in Scotland and we export some 19.3 terawatt hours of um, energy, which brings in something like um, three quarters of a billion pounds a year to the economy. Uh, so at present, we've done, we've done quite well. We've changed completely from oil and gas and coal and gas, such that our Overall consumption is now predominantly wind, 71%, 18% uh, hydro, and the rest of it, uh, of that 97% is probably a bit of solar and, and a tiny bit of tidal or wave, but primarily you can see we're, we're doing well uh, producing wind. And I think at the moment, slightly more of that comes from onshore than offshore. But of course, that's only part of the story as we are still primarily using gas and oil uh, and coal to to uh, provide heat and transport and of course industry and uh, for those of you in East Lothian who've seen the the uh, cement works near Dunbar that of course burns coal to make cement 
So we have got a huge amount to do by 2050 if we're going to cut out all the gas and oil and rely on renewables uh, or indeed nuclear if we're going to get to a green economy. So is it feasible to do that? And what does it mean if we're going to do it? Can you, you change the slides, Angus? Yep, that will keep. I thought, I, I thought I'd start with this rather interesting view of the um, periodic table. It, the color, the, the shapes have been adapted to sort of talk about uh, actual occurrence in the crust. So you can see there's lots of oxygen and hydrogen and nitrogen and carbon and the small amounts of the metal at the bottom. But the colours are what I really want you to, to focus on. And the, the ones that are really bright orange, there is a serious threat that we're going to... Um, you, Angus, yeah, I'll come back to that. Uh, <laughs> we're going to be have a problem with... But helium is, is a classic one. There is no renewable source of helium. Once we've used our helium, we've, we've got it. But you can see that some of the other ones uh, strontium, yttrium, zinc, galena, arsenic and things, silver. Uh, we're beginning to use up what we can get easily from mining. And there's a rising threat for some of the others like chromium and cobalt uh, uh, that are the orange ones. Uranium is one of those. And even the yellow ones have limited availability. Lithium, magnesium. And if you, if you just figure on, on two things, the little white telephones and black telephones are the elements that you use that are used in making telephones. And you can see a lot of those are in bright orange, yellow or dull orange, and even some gray, gray ones, which are min conflict mineral zones. So it's not going to be straightforward to change our production of electricity to um, renewables which use batteries and things like this that need need some of these elements so it's going to be quite quite a, a a struggle to move from where we are now to 2050 being completely electrical next one please and and on top of that when you look at building wind turbines they actually use a lot of nickel and copper and uh, some rare earth elements and things and it, it says in this picture 12 times more copper to create one kilowatt um, using wind power than from conventional power and the graph at the bottom there it's on my screen i've lost the bottom but basically we're copper mines are reducing the quality and amount that they can produce so there's a real threat that we're going to struggle to produce enough copper for the whole world to go electric and, and there's another example there of what might go wrong. An electric vehicle contains over twice the copper content of an average car. So two kilometers of copper wiring in each car. So copper is pretty, pretty important. So I'm just, what I'm going to finish off with the next slide, please. And this is something that is also very contentious. At the moment, we get our elements from traditional mining onshore. And we know that's getting to struggle. We can continue to do that. And we seem to have two options going forward. One of which is what we call the circular economy, where we've really, really got to work hard at transferring and reusing uh, elements so that we don't run out. And, and as I see it, if we are really struggling to, um, to generate enough elements to uh, to carry on with our electric economy, we could look at the deep sea and, and marine resources. Now, two thirds of the world is underwater. And one of the problems of mining underwater is the dust and all sorts of things get into the water. And there must be a horrendous uh, potential problem for ecosystems. And if the world does look at uh, mining offshore, then there's going to have to, I would have thought there was going to have to be a delay and a very close look and limited working and a monitoring of what happens before you could even do it on a large scale. But I just, I think some of you may not know what the options are for offshore. And I've just highlighted three 
different areas that three different elements manganese nodules can you just nip back all right back up yeah there we are manganese nodules you might know that you find them a lot of them are in the central pacific just south of uh, and, and they've formed over a long long time and they're in there is the potential to dredge them and you see they've got one percent copper in them which is as much if not more as some of the onshore mines so already there is an interest in mining them for copper where they have been trial mines in the 1970s we've been back and had a look at the seafloor and there's absolutely no sign of recovery of an ecosystem so it's it's very debatable as to whether it's ever going to be feasible to take those in a sensible way. A second source of minerals is crusts that form on seamounts, and they are very rich in cobalt compared with onshore cobalt mines. And cobalt is an important part of uh, new batteries and uh, electronics. And of course, you, you could chip off the cobalt rich crusts on the top of seamounts, which are restricted areas. and all right, they're very thin, few centimeter thick deposits, but as you can see, they've got quite a bit of cobalt and nickel in them. And the third area that people are looking at uh, is seafloor massive sulfides. You know, you've probably all seen black smokers and at mid ocean ridges, and those, those are associated with big hydrothermal activities. And that's where, uh, the first attempt to mine is in offshore in Papua New Guinea in a relatively shallow zone. And the analysis of boreholes from that show that some of them, although they're relatively small deposits, can hold up, up to 7% copper on average, as well as zinc and gold and, and silver. So as resources in onshore mines get less, there will be increasing pressure to mine offshore. Uh, there are potential to mine seamounts in the North Atlantic. There are potential to go for seafloor massive sulfides on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's offshore Norway, west of Scotland or down near Ascension Island. Uh, and we've got some big decisions to make as whether to we want to even try do this, do some experimental mining or throw it open to to uh, mining companies to start doing things and uh, clearly there's some hard decisions there and i i wonder whether we are actually going to run out of resources if we try to go electric without a huge increase in recycling so i'll stop there thank you thanks very much Bob. No, really interesting stuff and it does show what can be done because we have achieved this major change in, in uh, British electricity production in a relatively short time and the, the end of coal is, uh, is quite marked uh, but um, it's uh, a trend that's going to be very hard to continue um, if uh, we don't have the materials for uh, electricity production so uh, so much depends on switching to electricity uh, for uh, heating and, and, and transport in particular. Uh, but uh, we also uh, discussed at the uh, Edinburgh Geological Society's public lecture last week, uh, the production of green hydrogen, uh, which uh, is uh, really uh, great potential uh, using electricity uh, to produce hydrogen, which can then be stored and uh, would uh, really make a difference in terms of uh, providing electricity to even out the, the peaks and troughs of uh, uh, renewable energy pr production. But then that's a, an, another demand for electricity with all the attendant problems, as, uh, as Bob was setting out. It's interesting as well, Bob, thinking about uh, just from this, from a, a UK perspective about you know, where, where we get these metals from. Uh, so a lot of what you are talking about isn't, it's certainly not in the North Sea, it's not in the, really in the UK continental shelf for looking uh, international waters for for uh, yes metals. yes yep. nearly all these all these deposits are in international waters and and access to those is is given uh, by the seabed international seabed authority which has its headquarters in jamaica and they're the ones that give out licenses and they're still fretting and worrying and quite understandably 
under pressure not to give licenses because of the dangers to uh, to ecosystems. So there's a big tension building between uh, many countries that have got um, research licenses. You know, you can think about France, Russia, Germany, India, China, Poland, one or two others. Um, Britain hasn't got a a research license where I mean we've applied to, to try and get licenses but they're for 15 years and the British government doesn't seem to be willing to um, support a research project that lasts more than five years so it's, it's difficult to get permission there are there is actually a, a British company that does have a have a license uh, and is looking at uh, mining manganese nodules in the Pacific but it's a wholly owned uh, subsidiary of um, Lockheed, which is an American company. And American companies can't take licenses because the Americans haven't signed the Law of the Sea Convention. So they're using the British government to, to give a license to uh, an American company's British subsidy to uh, explore it. But British industry and British researchers have no, not, are one of the few major countries that hasn't got a, a research license to do research doesn't mean we can't do research but it's in a way if we had a license like that it would give preference to british companies to operate anything that we discovered but, uh, that's i don't know if you, i don't know if you can see the chat uh, uh bob mm. but jennifer's uh, suggesting that well we should be looking uh, elsewhere maybe in the so elsewhere in the in solar space. system yes, uh, yes to, to that's good. Find, uh, yes. find metals and uh, yeah yes well, I have a, I have a, a suspicion that, that we should be leaving the sea where it is and leaving the minerals underneath it and see if we can do without them. But uh, I thought you were about to say you had a spaceship and you were just about yeah. to <laughs> <laughs> set off <laughs> exploring for metals around the Cap system. Capture a, a meteorite or something. Yeah. yeah. Great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, interesting uh, questions and, and certainly problems. Uh, we, uh, I think, are, are well aware that even if we manage to solve the electricity problem, uh, there still uh, is likely to be demand uh, for uh, particularly burning natural gas and producing uh, carbon dioxide, uh, plus uh, all the other sources of carbon dioxide, including uh, agriculture. So uh, certainly part of the geological solutions that are talked about in terms of uh, reaching net zero is to actually uh, get some of that uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere uh, and put it underground. Uh, so it's uh, really great to have a first hand report uh, on that uh, from Chris Holdworth. He's just, I think you're just back from Iceland. Uh, so yeah. uh, it's, uh, you know, this again, it's really nice to hear uh, directly about potential solutions, solutions that are in place already. Uh, and uh, um, so, Chris, uh, if you'd like to share your screen, then over to you. Yeah, th thanks for that, Angus. Um, I'm just going to go into presenter mode. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay. Looking great. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you a very whistle stop tour of uh, why we're interested in storing carbon, uh, why we need to do it. Um, and that second point is particularly important because I'm very aware that, that too, there is a lot of um, apprehension around the idea of storing carbon, um, whether it's safe, whether it just gives us an excuse to continue burning fossil fuels. Um, so hopefully I'll answer those questions and you'll come away convinced that it is something we do need and it's, as I say, completely safe. Um, so I'm just going to start with this, this kind of schematic diagram. It's actually from The Economist um, that I think they ran a few months ago. And what they're doing here with this diagram is basically they are showing the carbon cycle. Now, the cause of climate change is that we are on balancing, we are imbalancing a natural cycle. And, you know, nature is full of different cycles. So we, we're all familiar with the water cycle and um, how the water goes from the sea, evaporates into cloud, clouds, rains on the land, fills rivers that then flow back into the sea. Carbon is much the same in that we have sources of carbon that are in the ground. In fact, the biggest source of carbon in the natural world is the solid earth or the geosphere. We have soils that hold lots of carbon, the biosphere, so that includes trees, 
the atmosphere, which is obviously something we're very interested in in terms of climate change, because that is the ultimate reason that we are we are trying to do something about it. And the oceans, the oceans hold an awful lot of carbon as well. And basically what humans have done over the past 200 years is we've come along and taken a load of geospheric carbon, so carbon that was in the ground, and stuck it into the atmosphere way more quickly than it would have ever naturally got there. Um, so we've caused an imbalance. As I said, this is this is from The Economist, uh, and maybe an easier uh, an easier way of visualising the carbon cycle in the mind that's a bit more familiar is like this figure on the right. This is actually from the um, IPCC reports, which are kind of the big documents that um, maybe some of you are familiar with that produce all the evidence on climate change. And it's just showing the same thing. So we have, we have carbon in the ground that we've taken out and burnt and put into the atmosphere, but we also have lots of other natural carbon sinks and sources. So we've got sea and you get cycling of carbon in the oceans. We have, so there's volcanic activity going on in Iceland just now and in La Palma in the Canary Isles. Volcanism is a, is a source of, of um, carbon. Um, forests, as we all know, trees hold carbon. So we are creating an imbalance in this cycle. And, and to kind of move the first diagram on a bit on the left there, we've taken a chunk out of the ground and stuck it in the atmosphere. So that 240, these numbers, I should say, are gigatons of carbon and annual fluxes. So we've taken about a third of the carbon that was already in the atmosphere and added another third on top of that. Um, and naturally, it would very rarely ever get there that quickly. And the consequence of that is a warming world. Um, so we need to do everything to stop taking carbon out the ground. And that is the number one most effective method of doing that. Stop taking this geospheric carbon and sticking it in the atmosphere. There's no, um, there's no uh, replacement for that. It's the most effective method. But um, there are also the other ways that we can, we can help rebalance this imbalance that we've caused. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. So this final version of that diagram from The Economist is showing some of the ways that we can do that. So number two here, which is taking carbon from the atmosphere into the biosphere, reforestation is a, is a perfect example of that. I'm going to talk about number five here, which is labeled as direct air capture. Uh, that's where you take carbon directly out the atmosphere and stick it underground. And I'm going to talk more generally about um, just how we store carbon underground. But I said I want to convince you all why we need to do this, because, you know, with carbon capture and storage, something that always comes along with it is, is those questions that I mentioned at the start. And I, I when I first heard of carbon capture and storage back in the early, late 2000s, maybe, I was very sceptical. I thought, OK, here we go. Here's the oil and gas companies coming along to give themselves an excuse to continue burning fossil fuels and continue operating in the same way that they always have. Um, we had the Paris Agreement that came along, as shown here in, in 2015. And basically, at the end of 2019, the UN said, OK, Paris Agreement, that's great. We want to try and limit global warming to one and a half, two degrees. Uh, what does do the 2020s look like in terms of what our emissions have to do if we're going to stay on, on track for Paris? And so this, if, if anyone wants to find more information on this, um, this article is on the BBC News, as I say, end of 2019. And the key statistic, if you remember one thing from this, what I say here, they worked out that every year of the 2020s, if we're going to stick to Paris, our emissions have to fall by 7.6% every year of the 2020s. And that's coming off the back of a decade in the 2010s, where our emissions on average went up by one and a half percent. So the past 10 years aren't really a good indicator for how, how we're gonna get on here. But we also had a, a completely unprecedented year last year because of COVID and the pandemic. And to put that figure, that 7.6% in perspective, you think of all the disruption, all the lockdowns, all the shutdown that we had last year, emissions fell by about six and a half percent. So we need a change in emissions of the magnitude of what we saw last year and a bit more every year of this decade. Now that's one almighty task. Doesn't mean we can't do it, but I think that that is one statistic that always stays in my head of why we need to do this. And we can do this, it's perfectly safe to do so. And that's what I'm gonna get into now. So 
the diagram on the left, I said about different ways that we can, we can store carbon back underground. The diagram on the right is when we are doing this, this number five arrow here, the different uh, mechanisms that we store carbon underground when we're doing it in a geological store like the geosphere. And basically A and B here, they are physical means of storing carbon underground. So with A, you would inject CO2 uh, into a reservoir deep underground. Uh, this will get done in the North Sea. Um, and because of the pressures that you're operating at, CO2 is a liquid there. And you have basically like a solid cap rock, just like a, bot a, a cap on a bottle that keeps the CO2 there and keeps it there for thousands, tens of thousands of years. B is where you actually have a rock that has lots of pore space in it, like a sponge. So you can, all, you as well as capping, having this cap like on a bottle, you actually have a sort of sponge of a rock that holds the CO2 in its pore space. And then methods C and D down here, they are chem chemical means of storing CO2 underground. And what I mean by that is, so for C here, we solubility trap the CO2. So what we do is we dissolve CO2 in water. We make, if you like, sparkling water. Um, and the final step that you can do to store CO2 underground is actually turn that CO2 that was a gas, is a liquid underground, and then turn it into solid rock minerals or stone, if you like. And that is the project that I work, I work with the projects in Iceland that does just that. Um, so I'll say a little bit about that before I finish up. Um, that project out in Iceland, like I said, called CarbFix. And basically what they do is they take CO2 out of the atmosphere and from their geothermal power plants here that they use to generate electricity. They dissolve it in water at the surface, so make fizzy water, inject that fizzy water underground where it reacts and forms solid car uh, carbonate minerals or stone, if you like. And you can see that here. So this white stuff here, the, the, the black gray rock that's all bubbly and porous, which is what you need to store the CO2, that's the basalt. So that's the kind of rock that you would stand on under the surface. Um, it's just slightly different as you where they're injecting it a couple of kilometers underground and then it reacts with the black rock the co2 reacts with the black rock and forms these white carbonate minerals here and um, so that's the phd i work on the very last thing i'm just going to say that this is all about uh, 25, uh 2045 or 2050 what scotland's going to look like and what the uk is going to look like we are going to be doing carbon capture and storage in the uk the way that's going to happen in practice is we're going to have what's called CCS hubs or clusters. So the areas in red here, so uh, out in Merseyside in the northwest, Humberside, northeast, Teesside, where I'm from in the northeast of England, and St Fergus up right on the northeast coast of Scotland, they will act as clusters where uh, CO2 will be set piped offshore to be stored deep underground in the North Sea. Uh, there'll also be some of the green hydrogen produced at some of these clusters, like I said. We're going to have them all over the UK. Generally, the other thing about these clusters is they're located where you have big sources, industry sources of CO2, Grangemouth being a perfect example of that. And we're all in Scotland. We're interested in Scotland. One of the kind of leading projects of this in Scotland is called the ACON project. And that the CCS cluster that, that involves is, is the port of St. Fergus here. But the ultimate aim of that is that CO2 will be piped from Grangemouth up to St. Fergus, then piped offshore and stored underground by the means that I talked about before. And this, this cluster will just grow and grow. So hydrogen will start to be produced at this cluster um, for the various purposes that we've kind of alluded to. Uh, there will be some direct capture out of the atmosphere and then piped off to be stored underground in the North Sea. You might even get shipping from Norway and the Netherlands, international shipping of CO2. So that you will hear more and more about CCS clusters in the UK, um, and they will become even more and more important factors of our, our economy um, in the years to come, and especially what by the time we're in 2045. But um, that's quite a whistle-stop tour. Uh, I've tried to cover as much ground as possible, but. I'd happy to take any questions um, and don't, you know, if you have concerns about CCS and questions you feel that still aren't, aren't answered or haven't been answered, please say, because uh, I think it's a really important aspect to cover. So I hope that was interesting. Brilliant. 
Uh, thanks very much, Chris. Uh, Anna's asking in the chat uh, about the risks, uh, are the mm. risks of geological CO2 storage? Yeah. So I'll take the the risk that is always talked about is, is, it, is the CO2 going to leak back up? Um, in terms of the, if you like, the physics and the chemistry of, of CO2 storage by those four different ways that I've, I've said, uh, we're very good at understanding reservoirs underground now. We've done it with getting oil and gas from the North Sea for years in the UK. Uh, we're very good at doing that. Now, when we put CO2 underground, it's very, very rare that whenever you do anything, you get 100% efficiency. But it's absolutely plausible that we will get high 90% of storage of CO2. And the reason it's the risk that we know the risks are very unlikely for you know, getting loads of the CO2 coming back up. If you think about it, oil and gas, they, they are stored underground in very similar means to what we're going to do with CO2. And they don't start leaking to the surface in the sea until we go and tap it and, and try and get and make a mistake when we're trying to abstract it. So it's technically it's perfectly possible. I think the bigger risk is uh, political or infrastructure. The, the terms that come along with CCS, I said at the start, CCS is not a silver bullet. It is not a replacement for getting rid of emissions. The analogy I always used to like, uh, I always uh, like to use, sorry, is that the world is in a sinking boat with climate change and we've got leaks all over the boat. Plug in those leaks, that, that is our getting rid of emissions. CCS is our bailer. It's perfectly safe. It's just there to plug the gaps where it's very difficult to get rid of emissions in heavy industry, in agriculture, in aviation. It's not, you need to make sure that when this technology gets deployed more and more, that companies cannot just use it as an excuse to continue to do what they do. It's a emergency special measure. So I think that's arguably the bigger risk. The technical side is, is pretty well understood and very low risk. Uh, J James is asking a, a question that uh, uh, occurs to, uh, to me as well, just in terms of if you can give us a sort of feel for this, the stuff that's already happening in Iceland and the developments are planned in the North Sea. I mean, we're talking about offsetting Europe's emissions, Scotland's emissions. Um, what sort of scale were we talking about if, if these things yeah. are going to get going? I can, well, I'll, I'll be quick. So Iceland, the scale at the moment, the, the scale that they do is of the order of, they capture about 10,000 tonnes a year um, at one power plant and they're scaling that up to different power plants. They're rapid, their kind of, um, if you like, uh, plan for scaling that up is, is extremely aggressive for the next um, five, 10 years. So the, the projects I work with, the carb, carb fix, they want to get to, capturing hundreds of thousands of tons within the next sort of five, six years. And then they are building a CO2 port on the south coast of Iceland, which by 2030, they want to be, cut the early 2030s, they want to be capturing over a million tons a year and storing it as minerals. And that, that is, you know, the UK, it's the Climate Change Committee, which guides the UK government on what it has to do to stick to its net zero commitments. And it, in its report, says we need millions of tons a year of carbon storage in the North Sea or, or wherever we're going to store it, but we need to have millions of tons a year by the mid 2030s, late 2030s. Um, so that's the kind of scales we're talking. But again, that's not an excuse for companies mm. to just continue burning when they when they have other options. Yeah. I just um, deal deal briefly with um, yeah I think I think um, uh, maybe uh, Bob is answering uh, Dick's questions about the the this nine to seven percent figure. Um, mm. you're, you're absolutely right um, that uh, you know there's uh, using uh, relying as we do on wind, uh, particularly in, in Scotland, uh, isn't the, the full solution because it is very variable uh, through the year. Um, and so that 97.4 figure is a real uh, amount from 2020. Uh, but what it says is that across the whole year, uh, Scotland uh, produced uh, that amount of electricity from renew renewable sources. However, it wasn't equally spread to exactly match demand through the year. Uh, so uh, we're st uh, still relying on import and export from elsewhere in, in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, I think even today, like lunchtime today, it was about 2% of uh, the 
UK's uh, electricity was coming from coal fired power stations. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's sometimes a few percent coming from coal, uh, but it's an awful lot lower than it would have been even about five, 10 years ago. Um, but we can come back to that in discussion uh, anyway. Um, just uh, uh, we'll move on a little bit uh, because I think one of the other things that we're all aware of um, uh, sitting uh, wherever we are around the world uh, is that uh, we do rely an awful lot on uh, natural gas uh, for heating. Uh, and uh, just about that time of year when people in Edinburgh are, are very much uh, doing that. Um, and uh, so looking to the future, that is one of the, the big areas where uh, our society is really uh, producing a lot of carbon dioxide. Uh, so there are some good solutions out there. And I think probably one of the messages of tonight is that the solutions exist, uh, but uh, it's uh, time, time to get on with it. And we can maybe come back to uh, um, Sorry, it was uh, Roger's point about actually what what how how do we get across to the politicians that uh, it's time to to get on with it? Uh, but uh, there's a lot that could be done to reduce our reliance on natural gas uh, in in Scotland uh, with uh, better insulation, uh, better windows, uh, uh, cutting down drafts. It's it's all very obvious, um, and we just need to get on with it at a, a massive scale. Uh, we will also probably be switching uh, to either electric heating, which is another um, uh, demand on electricity. So expecting electricity to do an awful lot over the next few decades, um, either direct heating from electricity or perhaps heat pumps. Um, so uh, there's some potential there uh, and particularly quite a bit of interest at the moment uh, in whether uh, uh, Scotland's abandoned coal mines uh, can be used. They've got warm water in them. Can we extract energy from uh, that warm water uh, and use it uh, in district heating schemes? Uh, so again, all that technology exists. It's just about the, the scale. Uh, and uh, the British Geological Survey has been doing some, some research in Glasgow on that over the last few years. So it's an, an active area of research. Um, however, I think we're all aware that uh, no matter what we do over the next uh, few decades to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions and get towards net zero, uh, we are still going to be living with climate change. We are living with uh, climate change uh, now. Uh, so uh, a big part of the story over the next few decades is going to be about how we uh, adapt uh, to ongoing climate change. Uh, even if we magically got to net zero this year, which I don't know if you've seen the news in the last couple of days, uh, we're very much not doing. Uh, we're going in the wrong direction still. Uh, but even if we did that, we'd still have the, the, the follow on effects of the emissions that are already being uh, produced already in the atmosphere. Uh, so change is coming. Uh, and uh, our final contributor this evening is Saraswati Thapi from uh, Nepal. And, and really, she really is joining us from Nepal tonight, uh, which is absolutely brilliant. Uh, she is a student uh, in the university in geosciences, uh, but she's doing her field work at the moment. So she's uh, back in Nepal, uh, but it was uh, really great uh, uh, that you were able to join us, uh, Saraswati. And over to you if uh, you would like to uh, tell us about your research and your uh, thoughts on uh, how we uh, cope with climate change in Scotland. And uh, I think as we've touched on a little bit already tonight, it's not just a Scottish problem uh, and it's the, the solutions that we have here will uh, um, have a, you know, an impact hopefully across the rest of the world as well. We are part of this global community that's uh, uh, suffering uh, tackling a, a common problem. Yeah, thank you, Angus. I'd like to share my screen okay. here. Great, that, you mm. should be able to do that. That's looking good. Oh. The wonders of technology, brilliant. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I want to go with the presentation mode. Mm. Great. Hope you can see my that's, screen. That's right? looking brilliant, yep. Yeah. Uh, Hello everyone, good evening. And uh, yeah, as uh, Angus said, I'm in uh, field work in uh, Nepal current, uh, currently and my PhD is uh, PhD research is related to uh, flood hazards and then I'm, I'm, I'm working on flood modeling and how can I uh, reduce the uh, flood, uh, flood hazards uh, by uh, modeling the uh, uh, different uh, 
prospect of the uh, flood and then the various uh, parameter that uh, uh, that impacts on the flood for example the sediment and the other uh, anthropogenic uh, changes, but here uh, today I'd like to share uh, some of the uh, some of the my uh, of, of uh, like the findings uh, during the literature review. So uh, th th this is not all about the, what uh, I'm doing, but the, uh, something that I have found during the uh, first year of my uh, uh, my PhD that during the li uh, literature review. So I'd like to share this uh, here. And yeah, I'll be talking about the impact of climate change in East Scotland on the on coastal change, river flooding, groundwater rise, and also how do we um, deal with the hotter uh, summer and the wetter uh, winter that we have been uh, hearing a lot of uh, time uh, at, at this issue. And if uh, we look at uh, these uh, diagrams. Uh, uh, this is the this is the research uh, uh, outputs uh, uh, the Edinburgh adopts uh, adopts a vision of uh, 2016 to 2050. This research shows the Scotland uh, Scotland climate is uh, changing over the uh, over the uh, last few decades and it it has become a warmer and the weather with increase in both temperature and the rainfall here we can see in the first uh, uh, diagram that the, uh, the change in temperature uh, uh, temperature is rising uh, and we can see this in the decadal scale and the, the rising uh, temperature is around 1.2 degree uh, centigrade uh, for for uh, for a uh, for in uh, in the decadal scale, and uh, this is the one of the region that we are getting the hotter uh, this hotter summer. And if we look at the winter as well, this uh, temperature uh, temperature a uh, change in temperature is rising as well uh, in slow rate than in uh, summer. And if we look at the, uh, the change in uh, precipitation, we can see that, uh, that the precipitation, change in precipitation is decreasing in summer. However, that is uh, increasing in, uh, in uh, winter. So that uh, this is the reason that uh, we are getting hotter uh, summer and the wetter winter. And uh, we have been uh, we have been observing the visual effect of uh, this climate change uh, by uh, by uh, by experiencing the earth, uh, earth is warming and the average temperature of uh, temp temperature rise of around 1.2 degree centigrade uh, in uh, recent decades, uh, and then also the uh, rainfall pattern are changing. We are facing the intense uh, rainfall in short duration of time that is causing the flash flood that we have been experiencing experiencing in uh, each monsoon, and then also the annual rainfall has also increased in uh, recent decades to a, a level of uh, or about 13% above the average uh, yearly uh, average for the yearly decades of the, the 20, uh, 20th century. And if we look at the, uh, the uh, sea level, that is also rising, um, rising and it has been uh, rising by uh, around uh, eight inches since 1980s and these are the, visual uh, effects of climate change and uh, if we look at the, some specific area for example the coastal uh, chains the coastal chains is also the coast is uh, uniquely exposed to climate change and uh, uh, due to the effect of that the climate uh, the temperature rise and the, um, the rainfall uh, uh, change in rainfall pattern and the rise in uh, sea level and also the due to the change in erosion and deposition here we can see the in 2000, uh, 2017, National Coastal uh, Change is, uh, Assessment found that the, uh, Scotland's uh, coastal erosion rates have doubled since 19, uh, seven, uh, 1970s, and then uh, and then all of uh, this could be the de uh, disastrous for the uh, for our uh, coastal um, coastal archaeology, and then uh, then uh, what the uh, what the how we are getting the information of uh, the, this uh, the the coastal changes and the coastal flooding is the SEPA is uh, is developing the flood uh, mapping to improve understanding of the coastal flood uh, rigs. And if we look at the uh, river flooding and then urban inundation, uh, which is due to the intense rainfall for the short duration 
of uh, the time uh, and also the also we have uh, we have uh, faced the the uh, flash flood uh, last time in uh, august in uh, glasgow and uh, also in the edinburgh in different uh, areas uh, due to the insufficient uh, drainage capacity uh, because the our uh, infrastructure uh, was developed uh, looking at the uh, uh, looking at those uh, run uh, surface runoff which had changed after after the after the years and then the uh, currently the rainfall pattern are different than the before and also the intensity uh, we are facing the high intense rainfall and also the uh, also the paved surface uh, increases the flash uh, flood uh, here we can see uh, one of the uh, graph from the uh, climate change at the uh, action plan uh, here we can see the as the paved surface are uh, increase uh, increases uh, the cumulative runoff volume uh, uh, will increase and that will cause the flash uh, flood in the, uh, in the urban area and that causing the urban inund inundation and in inundated and also the if we look at uh, one of the figure here, uh, this is the case of flash flood uh, due to have uh, due to heavy rain on uh, 7th of August in 2019, and uh, uh, and these uh, for the uh, for the awareness of the people, say I use uh, the flood warning and also giving the people a better uh, 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 chance of reducing the impact of flooding on their homes and uh, uh, business. Uh, but the, this is not the uh, the 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 complete uh, solution that uh, we are uh, we are just uh, uh, giving the awareness but we have to uh, this is the time that we have to uh, look for the long term uh, solution and uh, also the uh, if we look at the uh, look at the groundwater uh, groundwater table the groundwater table usually within a 5 meter of the ground from the ground surface in east scotland and uh, the interestingly one uh, in, uh, one uh, interesting uh, fact is that more than 80% of groundwater in east scotland is in good condition then we can also think about the use of this uh, ground uh, water as a as a uh, one of the important uh, uh, source uh, for water and then also we can see one example that the uh, yeah Scottish uh, Parliament and the dynamic earth are pumping water out uh, uh, out of their basement for the use and uh, uh, also uh, if we look at the how do we deal with this uh, hotter uh, summer and the uh, winter uh, winter I have uh, I listed um, as, um, some of the uh, points uh, that we can focus on and the many points uh, already the uh, previous speaker has uh, already explained about that. Uh, here, uh, uh, one interesting thing is uh, we can uh, we can look at the increase, uh, we can look uh, for the increasing the uh, greenery, uh, gr greenery in the cities and then the one, uh, one example that it's a Scotland government has already uh, planned and working on it that uh, to make the million tree city uh, uh, as uh, Edinburgh as million uh, tree cities and already uh, we know that Edinburgh has more than uh, 0.7 million uh, trees and then uh, uh, and then the population of Edinburgh is only around 0.5 million so uh, Edinburgh has already the uh, the trees more than uh, its population and uh, the government is planning to make it uh, 1 million and uh, and this is an example that we can also uh, consider the uh, increasing greenery uh, in the urban uh, areas. And the next is to increase the uh, increase the energy efficiency, uh, uh, efficiency, and also increase the use of renewable uh, energy that uh, we have already dis uh, discussed in previous uh, uh, previous uh, talk. That we can uh, we can uh, think about increasing the hydropower and other res uh, other uh, source of energy, and also the uh, also we can measure, report, and reduce the greenhouse gases that we have also discussed, and uh, we can uh, conserve and protect the water resources uh, through the efficiency reuse and storm water management and also eliminate the waste and pre uh, prevent the uh, pop, uh, pollution and increase the recy uh, re uh, recycling and the, uh, uh, one uh, of the 
important thing is to prioritize the sustainable technology and environmentally uh, preferable materials, product and uh, services. And uh, the next, uh, last but not least, the least, the next point is uh, we, we have to uh, we have to also think about the uh, about the design, construction, maintenance, and the operate uh, operate for the uh, how can we produce the high uh, performance sustainable building as a uh, as the uh, the new technology. Uh, which can use the uh, less uh, energy and uh, uh, from this uh, point uh, here I'd like to uh, say a few uh, things that changing uh, climate can increase the risks of uh, heat waves, flood, uh, drought and the, uh, and the fires. So uh, also the, the longer we wait the more uh, difficult uh, these uh, uh, challenges will become so there is an or they need to take account of these uh, impacts in the way we manage, plan, work, and uh, uh, live in our urban cities. So uh, here I'll, I'd like to stop, and then I, these are the things that I uh, wanted to share with you all. Thank you. And yeah, I'd like to uh, take any question uh, if you have. Thank you very much, Saraswati. It's great to hear from you. We look forward to having you back in Edinburgh once your fieldwork is finished and uh, have you contributing to further discussions in uh, Edinburgh. Uh, um, Andrea noted that uh, she's worked out the time differences and realised that you're stayed up late. <laughs> so thank you very much for, for joining us tonight. Uh, not, I know that not only are you interrupting your fieldwork, but also uh, it is uh, festival time in Nepal. So you've uh, also... Uh, so, uh, avoiding that to come and speak to us this evening so it's uh, really very much appreciated it's great to get your perspective in terms of uh, the, the issues we have in Scotland in terms of how, how we deal with the, the impacts of, of climate change going forward what, what we're going to have to do in, in Edinburgh so I think uh, um, there's actually one one question maybe you can put to the panel if anyone would like to uh, contribute to this um, uh, Derek is asking uh, about uh, the kind of time scales uh, that we're looking at this geologically and obviously in a very very short time scale just between now and, and 2050 um, uh, and he, what he says is well accepting that this uh, this is not a good situation in terms of human uh, interaction with climate and change in, in climate but actually uh, in a geological perspective is that is this not all just a bit of a blip uh, and the Milankovitch cycles will, will kick in and, and cool the earth again. So I don't know if anyone's got a kind of geological perspective on, on climate change uh, over uh, this slightly longer time, time period. Yeah, I can jump in and try and answer that one. Yeah, um, good point. I mean, in, I think when you look back to that long-term record, we do see a lot of variability, but what's, um, what, what's uh, key about the current uh, situation that we find ourselves in is that the rate of change is what it's not so much the the amount of co2 uh, if you remember some 50 60 odd million years ago it was a lot warmer than today and for many millions of years but it's not so much that we are the co2 that we're emitting the the amount is somewhat like abnormal it's the the rate of change which is the the unprecedented thing um so it's the case of like those past climates, like the 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 event I looked at, which is this kind of the best kind of analog that we we, we can get these kind of hypothermal warming events. I mean, geologically speaking, they're abrupt, they're instantaneous, but we're talking like sixty thousand human years. You know, it's uh, still very very. It takes the Earth a, a quite a long time, human on a human time scale, to produce the the amount of change that we're doing in like two centuries. So. Yeah, it's, it's the rate of change, which, which is unprecedented. But um, yes, the Earth will recover. I mean, you, you saw that in the graph, that the Earth was warmer than it is today. And over millions of years, carbon is stored in our carbon sinks that we've heard about. Uh, but on a human time scale, it's something that we need to focus on, is that how do we how do we combat climate change? And things like these Milankovitch cycles that was mentioned, like, yes, they, they do have a, they, they, they do are, have an expression on the climate, but what we're doing is kind of like surpassing even their influence it's like the human influence in the climate is now the number one as i said the, the number one control but i think that's a good thing as well because if we're the number one control in the climate we know that we know what, what we can do it's really down to human ingenuity and human will to change this around and it's something that 
the dinosaurs never had. So yeah, I, I think it's a it's a good empowering message that you know we know the problem, we know the solution. It's humans. So yeah. Thank you, Matthew. Any other final thoughts from any of the other panelists, and then we'll, we'll open it up for for general questions and chat. I, I can add just to say that, um, you know, like Matthew was saying, a lot of these natural cycles that they're over tens, if not hundreds of thousands of years, and equally, even if we could hang around, you know, bet on in fifty thousand years a Milankovitch cycle taking a bit of warming that we've induced off the planet. We can't hang around and wait to see that happen. Um, this is ultimately a question of what world do we want to live in? Uh, you know, how much of the biodiversity that we currently have do we still want to have? How well off and comfortable do we want our lives to be? That's the ultimate question. And like Matthew was saying, you know, we are quite clearly the cause of this. We've, like, as I said in my stuff, We've taken a heck of a lot of geological carbon and stuck it into the atmosphere way quicker than it would have ever naturally got yet there. So, um, you know, little little natural systems can absorb that. The oceans absorb a lot of that CO2, but they can only do that for so long. Um, and then you start to get the warming effects and the negative impacts that we're seeing now. So, um, yeah. Thank you, Chris. Uh Bob, you got any final thoughts? Well, it, it's a, I really like Matthew's uh, big slide that he started with, where you can see uh, over geological time there have been somewhat abrupt changes of of paleo temperatures, which you can measure from um, uh, all sorts of indirect ways, oxygen isotopes and other isotopes, and there does seem to be lots of tipping points in that record where the, the temperature changes slightly or the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere changes slightly and then the West Antarctic ice sheet melts or Greenland melts and we can correlate some of those with changes in sea level and that those tipping points we're reaching those at two degrees uh, with whatever it is four five hundred parts per million CO2 so we're very very close to uh, points in the geological record that have had a drastic effect on uh, climate and sea level. So uh, we can't leave it. We've got to act. So I wonder if you just just finally, uh, given that you're joining us tonight from Nepal, what, what's what's climate change looking like uh, where you are just now? Is it are there visible effects? Uh, in uh, you mean in Nepal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah we have been facing the the urban flooding here as well in Kathmandu. Uh, it's uh, uh, yeah, it's the uh, uh, it's been a few decades that uh, we are facing that. Uh, before that, we we didn't hear about the urban flooding, but recently, uh, uh, the the uh, many scientists uh, are saying like. Uh, it, yeah, the saying and the, the historical time series records of rainfall also uh, has shown that the, we are facing that intense rainfall and then we are, our drainage capacity uh, uh, has like uh, gone full immediately after the rain. So we are uh, we are facing the urban uh, flooding here in uh, Kathmandu as well. This is the one of the the visual uh, visual impact that we can uh, we can directly uh, uh, see. Um, and also the some of the uh, also the some of the air pollution that we are also facing here in uh, Kathmandu the uh, in a few years uh, yeah uh, only uh, I think uh, last year uh, we have uh, been listed that uh, Nepal uh, the Kathmandu city ha has been listed at the the uh, not suitable uh, year uh, that uh, we have here for respiratory system that uh, I I don't know exactly the the uh, the parameter uh, how uh, they have uh, they have done. Um, that a classification or the, the, the numbering, but uh, we are having the uh, one of the uh, main uh, air pollution and then the urban flooding. Yeah, these are the issues. Yeah, so it's uh, yeah uh, all around the world uh, very obvious that things are changing and uh, affecting uh, communities. So uh, hopefully uh, uh, you've all. Uh, 
I don't know if we've enjoyed tonight's presentations, but certainly lots of food for thought. Um, and uh, the problem is clear, uh, but uh, also uh, there are solutions uh, and uh, uh, we probably just need to get on with it. And COP26 uh, does give it a really good opportunity to uh, uh, have uh, people's voices heard really in terms of uh, actually needing action rather than just promises and targets for 2045 or, or, or 2050.